Is it? Am I on? Good evening, everyone. How are you? How are we doing? Welcome to Wednesday Night Live. Wasn't the hamburgers great? Awesome. So we continue in our, our journey through the story. And uh, I was thinking of, of an experience that happened to me. I was, uh, in the early years of Christ Church, I was teaching, uh, Judy and I would, would teach vacation Bible school. And uh, I had the, uh, the kindergartners. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd add, and one of the questions was to ask the kids, uh, you know, uh, where is God? You know, and that was the question I'd ask the kindergartners, where is God? You know, and they, some of the usual answers, right? And heaven, you know, and I had one kid just raise his hand like this, and I called upon him, and he said, God lives in the bathroom in our house. And I, I kind of went, what? He said, yeah, God lives in the bathroom in our house. And I said, are you sure of that? He said, yeah. Every morning my dad wakes up and beats on the bathroom door and goes, my God, are you still in there? <laughs> but seriously, folks, do you know where God is? Everywhere. And so, uh, as we continue in our journey of the story, whose story is it? God's story. It is God's story of his uh, salvation for the, for the created order, all of the world. And we have talked, uh, uh, I did some time back, about the difference between the two Greek words for time. Does anybody remember those two words? Yeah, that was one of them. Kairos and Kronos. Kronos is the Greek word when you talk about chronological time. You know, you talk about Kronos. A watch, ticking of a watch is Kronos. A calendar is Kronos. Okay? Done, it's one and done. It's time linear. Kairos is time before there was time. Kairos is God breaking in to Kronos. And I always like to make sure you see the movement of my hands. Kairos is God breaking into Kronos. And the way that he does that uh, is in some very special ways. And one of the ways in which he did that beyond the cross was through the experience of the children of Israel. I'm going to keep referring to them as the children of Israel. It wasn't until centuries later that the euphemistic term of the Jews uh, was used. So I'll, I'll refer to them as the children of Israel or maybe the Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> but God's kairos breaks in to the world's chronos through the experience of Moses. So we're going to finish up our journey through the book of Exodus and by way of review, okay? Exodus is a derivative, it's a direct English translation of the uh, Greek word exodos. And exodos literally translated means exit. Okay, so if you were to write that in Greek, it would say exodus. Okay, and... Um, so what is the story of Exodus then? If the word means exit, what's the, what is the whole story of Exodus about? Leaving. Leaving. Exactly. Leaving. It's an exit. And remember, now this, this is the pop quiz part, right? And yes, this is for a grade. What did I say about exit and entrance last week? Anybody remember? Oh, oh, oh! The bathroom at my house! No, oh. If you exit, then you enter into something? Every exit is at the same moment an entrance. 
When you walk out of a space, you automatically enter into another space. That is an exit from this room, but it is an entrance into the hallway. Every exit is at the same time an entrance. So, the book of Exodus is the story of the children of Israel exiting the bondage of slavery and entering into the covenant with God. So the story of Exodus is leaving bondage and entering covenant. So everything in the chapters of Exodus is about leaving and entering. Okay? <clears throat> and so one of the great paradigms of the book of Exodus um, is this. It's the wandering. Now have you ever begin, have you started to think why in the world did the children of Israel have to wander for 40 years? Right? I mean, why? Why? Any thoughts? No wrong answers. You get a gold star. You volunteered twice. Right. I'd heard some, uh, on many times I'd heard, well, God was punishing them for their apostasy of the golden calf and all that. Well, that's, that's really not, not it. The, the, the focus is, is that for 400 years, the children of Israel, that means four centuries, Generation after generation after generation of the Hebrews knew only one style of living. And that was the lifestyle of a slave. The only thing they had ever known was how to be a slave. A slave has no choice. A slave has no freedom. A slave is told what to do. They don't decide for themselves what to do. They are told what to do. They are, com they are kept bounded. To get that's, they're a slave. And that's, so that's all they knew. So God had to teach them how to live like people of faith. He had to show them firsthand how he works. And he also had to show them firsthand what happens when you violate what he says. And so it was as if God to say to the children of Israel, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. And we're going to walk for 40 years. Remember what I said early on about the number 40? 40 in the Bible means what? Time of preparation. Anytime you see a, a derivative of 40, you will see God doing something to prepare his people to receive something. Okay? What's 400? 40 times 10. 400 is a derivative of 40. I can maybe think a little bit further about maybe what that might, but I'm not a numerologist. I don't worship numbers and all that, but I, it is significant, right? So in essence, what God is doing is he's discipling the people. He is teaching them through the wilderness how to, how to be faithful, okay? And so what we discover from this is, first of all, that faith is a journey. Faith is always a journey. And that's one of the things I want you to take away from our story in Exodus. We are always on a journey. The minute we stop thinking we're on a journey with God is the, is the moment our faith begins to dwindle. We're always on a journey. We're always learning. We're always growing. 
God wants to journey with us. Okay, so, refresh your course. Here is the, here is the 40 years of wandering. Okay, they left the Nile Delta. They crossed the Red Sea. They journeyed down to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, <clears throat> two reasons why they did that. First of all, you just simply cannot cross the Sinai Desert. Life cannot be sustained. And how many people were there? I remember I gave you a number last week. Three million. Estimated three million. Remember because the, the uh, Exodus says there were 600,000 men. So that means there were 600,000 plus women. And if there's 600,000 men and 600,000 women, there's going to be lots of other little children. So you're talking upwards of 3 million, a mass migration. So you had to follow a sea route because what does the sea provide? Food. Not water, but food. But it's also in the wilderness when they started to grumble about things. You know, he brought the manna from heaven, the bread of heaven, the water, the quail. He's showing them. And how did they travel? Do you remember? How, what guided them in their travels? The cloud, cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. They are witnessing the miracles of God. And it, sometimes it, it, it takes a while to get it in. Right? So, by way of review, the real Moses is Charlton Heston. Moses. Oh, I just love that show. Magnificent. All right, let me get to my notes here. Stay on track, Dan. Okay, what do you know about the Ten Commandments? They're written in stone. Written in stone. <laughs> That's what you remember. <laughs> there were 15 and one got dropped. I will say I got corrected today because I falsely quoted that it was from Monty Python it really was from Mel Brooks, The History of the World. So I, I really messed up on that. I stand corrected. <laughs> yeah, so um, I want to go back to the original question, why the wandering? They're wandering because God's got to teach them how to live with him. God's teaching them. And so the first thing he teaches them is the importance of law. So that's the first lesson in the wilderness wanderings. So they, they are wandering from the Nile Delta down to the Mount Sinai. You can imagine that that, that is the real exciting part after 400 years of slavery. They, you know, they, they work their way down to Sinai and is at Sinai that... Moses ascends the mountain and um, he receives the Ten Commandments. So I want to just talk about the nature of law for a moment. Okay. What does law do? What does law do? Controls, organizes, order. Okay, the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish faith even today says there is no freedom apart from the law. And I want you to think about that for a moment. When they were slaves, they were slaves to the arbitrary dictates of Pharaoh. He controlled everything in their lives. Right? The law provides structure and order and it provides a moral code on how you and I relate. There's a law that says do not murder. Okay? Which means life is important. Life is sacred. That's why he says don't murder. Right? So that creates a moral code. 
And once we know what the moral code is, we know how to relate to one another. See, so God is saying, I'm giving you a part of myself. I am a moral being. And a moral being follows order. And order is created by law. You shall have no other God before me. You shall keep the Sabbath holy. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. Keep the Sabbath holy. Honor your father and your mother. Right? He's creating order. And then he's telling the people to follow that because law creates order. Right? So he's, he's teaching them this. He's, he's giving it to them. And if you look, um, the Ten Commandments are in chapter 20. We're going to go through a lot of chapters, and I just want to highlight to them, but chapter 21 to chapter 24 is Moses on top of the mountain. Moses was on top of the mountain, and he's receiving, he's in conversation with God, and he is receiving not only the Ten Commandments, uh, but he's receiving all types of, of laws for the ordering of life. Um, like chapter 22, the laws concerning theft, the laws concerning property, laws concerning dishonesty. If you read these, I mean, if you have trouble sleeping some night, just start reading these and it'll knock you out. The reason why it knocks you out is because it is so rote for us. It is so boring for us. But to the Hebrews, it was brand new. It was brand new. And it was as if, tell us more. Tell us more. You mean Pharaoh's not going to, nobody's going to tell me what to do? No, here's the law. You choose. That's what freedom means. You choose. So he gives the law. And it, it just it goes on through. Uh, specifically, I want you to look at uh, chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. Then God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at the mountain. And then look at verse 4. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. So you see Moses is up there and he's, he's cutting out the stone. He's writing. He's, he's receiving all of these instructions. Now mind you, this is new to Moses as well. And he's learning like the people. And so the purpose of the law is to provide order. To, to fight anarchy. Um, I'll close with this and then we'll go on to the next purpose for the wandering. Um, I have a master's degree in child psychology from the University of Houston. And... Uh, in the coursework that I did there, I, I, learned, I became a behavioral developmentalist. That's my, my orientation to how life grows and develops. And there's a very famous behavioral, uh, behavioral developmental scientist and pioneer by the name of Piaget. I don't know if you've ever heard of Piaget. But he would study his own children. And he did something once. He, took, he lived in France. He took his children out to the French countryside, wide open, and he told them, Go play. And he just watched them. And the children were huddled in a small area. They are in a magnificent meadow field, wide open. And they played in a very small area. He then took them to his estate home, put them in the backyard, and he said again, Go play. They ran all over the place. And he pulled them aside after they were done and he said, why in the wide open country you stayed in one little area, but in the backyard you ran all over? And one of the children said, because father, in the country we did not know how far we could go. 
They had no boundaries. Boundaries created order. Boundaries created safety. Why did God give the law? To create boundaries. So we would know where we could go. And then we could choose to be in or out. Purpose of the law. Questions on that before we move on to the next? Roll along. Yeah. Right. Right. Gave them out of love. Gave them out of love. Yeah. You ever, you ever raising children? You know, Danny was touching the stove. I don't know if anybody... That child... Don't touch the stove. Don't touch the stove. What would he do? Really? It's not like I couldn't explain to Danny at the age of three in the internal workings of flame and fire and heat and the transfer of heat to the cast irons. I just said, don't touch the stove. Right? And then he made a decision and I said, I did what every loving father would do. I told you don't touch it. <laughs> right? You suffer the consequences. Okay. But they don't hear the first word you said. Right. And now translate all of that to God over us. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. You know, Jesus, when he talks about in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he'll, and he'll talk about, um, uh, you know, there's a law that says do not murder, but he says if you say something, harsh to another, that's like committing murder. You can kill the soul. You can destroy the soul with words. Did your parents ever teach you that limerick? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but what? Words can never harm me. That's a lie. That is a lie. Words cut deep. Words can never be taken back. You can say I'm sorry, but they can never be taken back. Words can kill. And what's one of the commandments? Do not kill. How do we relate to one another? Boundaries, order, so that we might live. That's what he does. Okay. The other lesson of the wanderings begins in chapter 25. The tabernacle in the wilderness. So just let me throw that out, kind of word association for a moment. What do you think about when you hear the word tabernacle? What comes to your mind? Is that machine talking to me? Is it like Judy and the... <laughs> tabernacle, what, is it, what, what comes to your mind when you hear the word tabernacle? Temporary, okay. What was that? Holy place. Dwelling place. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. The next thing God did in the wilderness after he gave the boundary of the laws was to say, you and I are in a relationship. I'm your God and you are my people. And I'm a jealous God, remember that? He's a and what does jealousy mean? Possessive. If you're jealous, you are possessive. God doesn't want us with anybody else. He wants us for himself. And uh, how good am I, I'll let you judge me, how good am I at keeping the Ten Commandments? I better be, right? <laughs> well, I, I think there are nine commandments and one suggestion. But I won't tell you which one's the suggestion. The answer is, I'm not. None of us are. 
The answer is we are all going to fall in sin before God. So how do we repair that relationship when it breaks? God says, let me show you how. And the way that we repair the relationship is through the establishment of the tabernacle for worship. Okay, in, in the scriptures and in Christian theology, there is a word for, what, for the purpose of the tabernacle is that now that God has given to us the laws and we're now learning how to live with the laws, he's now establishing the, uh, the ritual of worship and the role of worship. And the key phrase in this, oh, you can't see it that well, atonement. You see that? Atonement. Uh, the best way to describe what atonement means, I like to parse the word. At one. Atone, A-T-O-N-E, is at one. Atonement is at one with God. So God sets out a system by which, when the relationship is broken, we can find renewal and repair through the practice of worship. God sets up, and so I want you to just start looking. Uh, chapter starting at chapter 25 and it goes all the way to chapter 32 so 25 to 32 in Exodus is the instruction manual for building the tabernacle okay Why the tabernacle? Why do we worship? Well, God created humanity with the need to know God. There is an inner hunger in every human being. It's almost as if God creates us in the mother's womb. In the scriptures it says, the book of Jeremiah, I knew you in your mother's womb. And there's a little piece of the DNA that he holds out. And that's the awareness of God. It's called the search for spirituality. It's a drive. And it's that drive that causes us to seek. It's that drive that causes people to do all sorts of crazy things. You know, I've, I've, I've said for 40 years, I'll continue until I die. There is no such thing as an atheist. Everybody believes in a God. It's just a question of which God you choose to believe in. We all put our trust in things we cannot prove. Right? I put my trust in what I've experienced in Jesus. And every time I do that, it, it guides me. Right? So uh, God's people were given instructions on, pacific, on specific places and practices to worship. The tabernacle is a portable place of worship. Uh, God is present. And the pillar of fire and the cloud guide it. Okay? The, uh, when the cloud rose from the tabernacle after it was consecrated by God, that was the signal for the people to move. And when the cloud rested, that's when they stopped. And that, that was their journey through. The tabernacle has a lot of integral parts to it. And I'd like for us to take a look at those uh, for a moment. Um, let's see. Look at um, chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons uh, of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man uh, whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. <laughs> That's the first capital campaign. <laughs> We've had a capital campaign here, haven't we? Yeah. Well, it, it continues. What happens when you make a... Yes, sir. Oh, 
Why is that? Well, they have to pull up stakes. That's a great question. I, I, I couldn't answer that. In my mind, it's like, you know, a MASH hospital, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Anybody ever watch MASH? I love that show. You pull up stakes, you pack it, and then you move. It's portable. So, isn't that what I said? Why, thank you. We can go home now. <laughs> it's not everybody gets to go to work with his wife. Yes, sir. Roger. That's one time today, you were right. <laughs> I mean, do you know what it's like to stand up here and have my wife and Roger here? The only ones that's really smiling at me is Charlie. God bless you, Charlie. Thank you. Right? So the, the tabernacle became the dwelling place of God. And it, it became the sacred ground of God on earth. Uh, and, it, 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 and it formed the rudimentary foundations for the establishment of the temple and everything around it. And as a matter of fact, everything we do today, even in our Protestant theology, is rooted in the foundations of the tabernacle. That's where our roots are. And so what are some of the elements? Well, we know that there is an altar uh, where you sacrificed. Okay? That's where you would bring your livestock because remember, wealth in the Bible was determined through livestock. What, what, you know, sheep, things like that. And... Um, <clears throat> The worship of God is a participatory. It's a buy-in. When you make a contribution, you are sacrificing. You are having what we might call today buy-in. Right? You, 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 you have skin in the game, which means also to take it out of the secular and return it to the sacred. You're exercising faith. You are believing that I can let go of some of my wealth and that God will bless me and God will continue to sustain me. That's what he said to the children of Israel. Let's, let's keep walking and I'm going to show you how I provide for you. Are you going to demonstrate your trust in me? That's, okay, so there was the, uh, the basin uh, for purification Right, and then there was the showbread. The bread and wine are, are, were, and are integral parts of Jewish worship. Does it sound familiar? Altar, purification bowl, the showbread, the wine. I'm starting to see. So in all of these things, God got very specific. I mean, you can just go through this. He talks about the lampstands, chapter 25, verse 31. And he, I mean, he gives you measurements and colors, and he's a great interior decorator. Um, verse 28, uh, chapter 28, I always like to bring this up, especially Methodists understand this. It's our Baptist brethren that struggle with this. Um, verse 1. Uh, then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to me. And he named them in um, verse 2. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Do you know why, why Roger and I wear robes? Because they're holy garments outlined and the tabernacle experience. That's, that's part of the reason. Now, it's a little different in here, but that's, that's okay. God understands that. But I want you to have context for things. Right? So, uh, out of the tabernacle experience comes these, these primary elements that you see in Jewish worship today. Um, you have the uh, Ark of the Testimony, which is the covenant the Ark of the Covenant. And what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? 
the Ten Commandments, yeah, the stones, the stone tablets, which in reality, unlike Raiders of the Lost Ark, chapter 20 to 23 are all the laws. It's quite possible there were several tablets in there with all the different laws. Remember I said two weeks ago, how many, how many commandments are there in the Bible? 637. We have a hard time keeping 10. Try 637. Anywhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when the phraseology is, and God said, go do, that, that becomes a commandment. The first commandment is when God said to Adam and Eve, go therefore and multiply. Have children. To the Jew, that's the first commandment. Then you have the, um, the copper basin for the act of purification, the altar for the sacrifice that is made, uh, the candle stands, the incense. Burning of incense was a command of God so that the scriptures say, and the prayers of the people rise as a fragrant aroma to God. So the higher church, higher Anglican style churches, Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, some Lutherans, uh, some Methodists, they still do incense. You know, it's the prayers of the people as a fragrant aroma to God. It's, it's in here. But this is what I want. I want, us to, I want you to look at this picture. Just keep these things in mind, right? Let me go back one. Right? So there are, there are the original elements of the tabernacle. The holy ground, the holy of holies. That picture look familiar? What elements of the tabernacle do you see in our sanctuary? An altar. And what do you place on the altar? Sacrifice. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. What are we doing? We are taking a portion of our wealth. We don't sacrifice sheep and goats. We sacrifice Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln. So you can get what I'm saying? What did I do? I'm sorry, right? Yeah, in this room, yeah. And I couldn't capture, I, I failed to capture the, the baptismal, but this, this is a perfect illustration of the basin. The Jews, even today, have the act of purification. In each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, who was baptizing? John the Methodist. Oh, come on, that's as good as it's going to get tonight. John the Baptist, he was baptizing. The church did not create the act of purification. I mean baptism. In Judaism today, it's called purification. You are purified before coming into the presence of God. You purify yourself. Well, when we baptize you, you are purified once and for all. And it says in the scriptures, there is one Lord, one faith, and what? One baptism, which means when you've been baptized, you have gone through the rite of purification and you are now made clean. Remember the word clean, unclean with the Jews, a big thing for them and for us. Right? What else do you see? They dip in the holy water, right? It's the act of purification. And uh, where did they get that? They got that from here. Everything is connected to the tabernacle wilderness. And, and unfortunately, in modern days, we think we created everything. And we created nothing. It's just important to hold on to why these things. Um, I, like the, I like the fact that our church has uh, lampstands as opposed to letting them sit in the altar. I wish we'd have thought about that 30 years ago. 
because we just set the candles on the altar, but you had lampstands, and they had lampstands in the tabernacle. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of awesome to, to see those sort of things, okay? We have you have what? We have what they didn't have. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. We had, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And the cross. Okay? So, yes, sir. Also have the, covenant on the, altar. the covenant on the altar, the Bible. Well, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, because the sign of the covenant with Moses are the stones. The Ten Commandments is the sign of the covenant. So, yeah, placing the uh, Bible on the altar. Oh, you got a picture right there, too. Oh, golly, see? Y'all are with it. Way to go. If they sang, of course they did. Now, all you got to do is uh, see in the Psalms where it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's what I do. I make a joyful noise. Right. So they, they I'm, I, would, I would bet and guess they sang a cappella. Maybe they learned how to make instruments. But the psalms are filled with a call to sing and to praise and to dance. You know, all kinds of things. It's a happy occasion. Okay? So, why in the wilderness? God's teaching them the law. Boundaries. Then God sets up the practice of worship to build and nurture a relationship and he establishes a means by which we can repair the relationship when it broke. Adam and Eve did not have a means by which to repair the relationship. And so they had to suffer the consequences. When God says it, that's it. It happens. So now he's established the means by which when a relationship breaks, it can be kept. And for the next centuries, we go, on, Lord, we're trying, but we just can't seem to keep. Well, that's the rest of the story when, when you all get to the New Testament. And then for the, for the singing, I always thought, I mean, this was at the very beginning, God was teaching, training, implementing, and developing laws and instructing the Lord. I'll keep it brief. No, no, I was trying to figure out how much time we. Because I can't see. Now that's funny, Roger. I love you too, man. I always thought for the singing, you know, the very beginning, is people would go and I would see it was the well and forgiveness and anxiety of God. I'm so, you know, people would cry out to God or people would celebrate, you know, just in excitement one way or the other, that wailing or that vocalization of excitement. Yeah, and, and the thing to remember is that monotheistic worship, what does that mean? One God. Remember the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, 
Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. They call that the six words of salvation. And it's, it is their single focus. And that never existed in human history. We Americans have centuries of ancestors who worship God through Jesus Christ. Everything is second nature. This is first nature. There is no experience. So God's taking 40 years to train the Hebrews so that through the children of Israel he can bring global salvation to the promised Messiah. And what does that do? The law of love, back to what you said, the law of love, that which binds us together, that which gives us purpose, that which sets us free. We are the recipients of God first working with the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's why Exodus is so important. They are leaving the bondage of slavery, and I'll use New Testament language, the bondage of slavery to sin. Well, I, I got a question here, and then I'll come back over here. Uh, it's quite possible. They were, they, were, they were at the whim of Pharaoh. They were literally at the whim, whatever Pharaoh wanted. So for 400 years plus. Right. They, they well, you're, you're right. No, no. The, the seventh day of rest was established in the tabernacle worship. That's where it came from. Question? Be at one. Be at one with God to return to God, and it sets up the Christ to be that final mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. that so often we've heard uh, the forty years as a punishment. As a punishment. So this is a whole new. It's a whole new, and that's what I'm trying to say to you is that the God we believe in is not a vindictive God he doesn't kill people I mean people do die in the process we hear when we get to Joshua um, <laughs> God doesn't punish remember I said it's consequences when God says it that's it you eat from the fruit you're going to die. Oh, he wouldn't do that to me. I'm his favorite. We're the ones who call it punishment. God calls it consequences. Parents, does that sound familiar? Danny, don't touch the stove. Did I punish him when he burned his hand? I grieved with him, I cried with him, and I said, I told you, don't do that. Let me fix it. When we sin, God cries. And God says, I told you, don't do that. Let me help you heal it. Our God is a God of love. And so he doesn't punish. It's the consequence of our choices. And no one is free unless they can make a choice. Reminds me of a, a statistic. I haven't used it yet, and I don't think I will in the remaining sermons, but uh, I, I learned in our prison ministry at, at my former church that um, a, an inmate in the Texas prison system has 250 choices a day they get to make. On average, you and I make 5,000 choices a day. What time we get up, what we eat, where we go, 
what we read, what we watch, that to that to that to that, what we put on to that. And you multiply 5,000 choices a day times 365. All of a sudden, you're looking at and look at the prisoners. By their own actions, they had no choices. That's the power of the, the order, the rule. Um, and so we're finally in chapters. I want to get, before I run out of time, because Maggie said I have to be done by seven. And when Maggie says it, I'm done. So uh, what happens in chapter 32? Turn to chapter 32. Moses, how long has he been up on the mountain? Go ahead and guess. Forty days. There's that number again. What happens when he comes down out of the mountain? They're worshiping the golden calf. Okay, let's take a look at... Um, what was that? Was that the alarm for me to be quiet? <laughs> Somebody would just help me tell them So this reminds me one Sunday... At Christ Church, Danny had come in from college and he sit next because Judy had her pew and that, nobody would sit around her. <laughs> and there's, and I'm standing up and preaching, there's, there's Danny has his arm around Judy and they're, just, and they're just making me smile and a phone starts ringing. And Danny goes like this. And he moves away from Judy, and I'm preaching, and he goes, <laughs> he wanted to be real clear, it's not my phone, Dad. You remember that? <laughs> you couldn't find the phone and turn it off, could you? All right, so um, we can't read the four, four chapters in here, but... Um, Uh, chapter 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt, <clears throat> who did not know what has, be we what has become of him. What happens? If you were to read chapter 34. 34, what did I say? 32, sorry. What happens? They have a party. They start... What did they do? They reverted to their old ways. That's what they did. And Aaron did that. I mean, that it's probably right. What in the world were you thinking? Why do you think he did it? Peer pressure is possibility. Janice? Please the people. Mm -hmm. Well, I called my friend... Uh, Rabbi Eddie Goldberg and I told him that I was going to be talking about this and I wanted a perspective from him about Aaron and, and what happened. And he referenced me to a, a Chabad that's a sect of Judaism the Chabad and uh, I found this and I wanted to read it to you. I found it very interesting from the Jewish perspective on this. Our ancestors were in fact not guilty of replacing God, but of making a corporal image of God, which uh, is also prohibited by the scriptures as idolatry. But our ancestors came from a culture in which when they were worried, they worshiped deities they could create. I found that interesting. It's and, and, and as I read a little further, it was like Aaron is going, oh, Lord, if I don't do something, they really could go crazy. Now, this is 
Jewish interpretation of their scriptures. That's what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's what it was, but I find it very interesting, and I, I started to think, well, when we are confused, when we are lost, remember they're, all, they're new at this thing called faith? Okay, Moses is gone. He's up in the mountain. We've heard rumblings up there. He's probably dead. What are we going to do? They revert back. I'm wondering if Aaron was just trying to say, well, don't get, go, okay, I can do this, but don't go too far. I think Aaron had his own come to Jesus moment. Of course, Jesus wasn't there at the time. But you understand what I'm trying to say. So this is what I, I, I kind of conclude from this. There's a problem of the past. Moses was gone for 40 days, so they doubted his survival. Access to God required uh, a, a corporal image. They needed something to look at. Okay? They needed something to hold on to. Um, so they created a deity. Uh, I spelled Aaron wrong. I apologize for that. Jewish theology, and this was a synopsis from this. Aaron tried to shepherd away, better to guide them than allow them to wander on their own. I thought, well, that's, that's kind of interesting to look at it that way. I still think you have to say, what were you doing, Aaron? And I think only Aaron before God can answer that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that fits in with this. Uh, that's assuming some good, good attitude on Aaron's part. Um, I think the wilderness lesson with the rebellion is this. Can you believe in a God you cannot see? Four centuries, they, they were raised in a culture in which you had to see the gods. And all you had to do was look at Pharaoh because Pharaoh was God. Right? And so I think part of this struggle is they are coming to grips with this one God is an invisible God. Mostly. Can you believe? So you see the struggle now in the wilderness? The wilderness has a struggle. And the purpose of the wilderness was this. First of all, you walk with God. Faith is a journey. I, I was this, uh, faith is, is a journey and not a destination. We know what the reward is for our journey. And we could say that, that's heaven, eternal life. That could be the destination, but we're on a journey on this planet. We keep God's laws. He gave us the laws, which establishes hope for the future. We have a moral code. We know what to expect from one another. That gives us hope that tomorrow will be good. And when we worship God, we experience the inexpressible love of God. And what does the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest is love. Faith, walking with God. Hope, obeying God. Love, worship God. Exodus. Leaving the bondage of slavery and sin. Entering into a covenant with God. Let's close in prayer and then we can continue to talk. Yes. Make a point. Oh, absolutely. No, there was not a, it's not a, a perpetual motion. It, 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 easy, easy. They would have encampments and... And I can assure you, as they were moving up north, 
The Canaanites knew they were coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Three million people were coming up. They know they're coming. Okay. We thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for the food and fellowship. Thank you for the presence of your spirit that moves through each and every one of us. Guard and guide us as we journey through this story, your story, and help us find our place in it. So, Lord, send us from this place into our days tomorrow, and let us be a mirror that will reflect your love to all we meet. We pray this in Jesus' name.